Hello there, and welcome to Circling the Bases. My name is Chris Crawford. I hope everyone is enjoying playoff baseball, and we've got to talk about it. So I've got my good buddies slash colleagues slash boss, uh, Mr. DJ Short and Mr. Drew Silva. Guys, how's it going? Not bad. Hanging in there. I guess you're the only person in this room with uh, a team <laughs> that's still in the hunt. That was a very yeah. quick exit for my Cardinals. Yeah. Which we kind of predicted, but... We did. Well, yeah. one of us kind of didn't predict it but that's okay we won't uh, we won't uh, lament on too many picks but uh i will ask you guys real quick before we get into the alds stuff just your overall thoughts on what you thought about that weekend i have to be honest with you i'm a little biased because the mariners you know came out with that sweep but i had a blast watching that those those baseball games how did you guys feel about it i wanted to die <laughs> Okay, elaborate. Um, no, I, I I found the non Mets portion very enjoyable. Sure, I have to say. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I I think I said it last week, but I hope they keep this on a weekend because yeah, yeah, it was just a lot of fun, and it's nice for those teams that get the honor of hosting the best of three to you know incorporate that into like a celebration for the entire. I I got to go to game two, which was boring but cool um it was nice to be there and for some reason when i'm at the stadium i don't get as nervous but yeah yeah i'm with you on that that game one the, the way the cardinals blew it in the ninth inning I, I don't ever want to talk about it again yeah well, oh my goodness i felt so bad for you buddy well so relatively <laughs> one one criticism i have of this format so i think maybe this was a result of the the lockout that things had to be condensed the way that they were Sure. But I think ideally in future seasons, I do not want to see this is the Mets and Braves situation. I don't want to see two teams tied with the same exact record in first place at the end of the season. And then the season series or yeah, the season series determine the seeding and who wins the division, all that. I would hope that in a non lockout year that can be settled with a game 163. Right. Um, it just doesn't. I mean, the Braves did win the season series, but I should that should a game? I don't know if that should really be the determining factor. I think ideally there'd be a one sixty three, and then you set the field. That's I don't I don't like the idea of games in May and April having so much power over this thing. Like right, yeah. Like like for instance, for a little while, while I was sillyly panicking about the Mariners having a tiebreak over Baltimore, and they ended up winning by like five games or whatever, I was thinking. These two teams have not played since June, and these teams were way different baseball teams than they are right now. Is that really a fair determination, uh, Drew? Right. Do you agree that we need to have a tiebreaker ga uh, one games one sixty three going forward? So is that built into the new CBA? This is I'm like, not one hundred. I don't. Think I'm not so clear that. on that either. No, I think um, that's a, a good. Uh, a situation that they're going to monitor, uh, so to speak, where it, I imagine especially after the Braves Mets thing that they are going to be like, Oh, maybe we do need tiebreaker games because it, it made a huge difference. It, it made a massive difference in um, how this is all going to go. I, I really hope they have tiebreaker games going forward. I would hope so too. That's the way to do it. Like this, like you said, the season series thing is, is silly. Cause it's not like these teams are always going to be playing each other down the stretch and, no, um, for it to, to be decided that way, especially kind of in the wild card too. Like that's, it's far too random. The season series thing when next year, you're not going to be playing yeah. teams as much. There's the that's balance schedule point. coming into play. Yeah. Um, so I, I feel like I, I'm not knowledgeable on how this is supposed to work moving forward. Is this is going to be the new thing or we don't really know yet. Um, I, I realized why they had to do it this year because they just didn't have time sure, to, right. to have a game 163 and all the travel that would be involved to to open the wild card series. I'm guessing it might be different in future seasons, but I, I, think, I don't know that for a fact. Uh, real quick, one question for you guys. Do you like having all three games for the higher seed at home? Or do you believe going forward that maybe especially for the wild card series – maybe having one of those games being played on the road if they get to game three, or do you like the home field advantage for the I, higher seed? I think it might just take too long. Um, and you're, you're just adding to the idle time for the, for the buy team. Yeah. Potentially. See, the thing about this is 
I, that's what I was thinking is, okay, you don't want to do the travel and stuff. But I looked at the schedule for the ALDS. They're literally both teams, if they're game five, they're traveling Sunday to go play Monday. So, like, I don't get the real big difference between traveling Saturday to get there Sunday. I mean, I think if I was going forward as the, the ruler, supreme leader of baseball, the division winner should get all three games at home. That could yeah, be yeah. their advantage. If you're the wild card four, if you're the first wild card, and you're playing the second wild card. Maybe if game three should be go played on the road, but logistically that's tough. It, it's a, yeah. it's a tough one, but I, I mean, again, I just think that's weird that you can have ALDS game five played a day after like, and that's one where I definitely would want the teams to have a travel day. You know what I mean? Um, it's just a little weird to me that they can't put that together. Um, but I, I, at the same time, it's not like the end of the world play better and you get the higher seed and you won't have to worry about it. Is, uh, go ahead. Isn't it a little weird that the AL teams are off today? It's yeah. extremely weird. So we're recording on Wednesday, by the yeah. way, just so you know, we're recording right before game two of the NLDS, but I think it's one of the more bizarre things. And again, it makes me wonder about like how big the logistics truly are. If you can build in this off day between game one and game two. Yeah, how much of that is for like TV purposes? I, I, I don't is. know. That's what yeah. it all is, right? And I think part of that is you're going to see because starting in the NLCS, it's going to be this way you build in, I think, that everybody is playing every day. You know what I'm saying? Like you're not going to have a travel day for those teams to um not have any type of baseball going on in the NLCS. It's it's built to where like game one of the ALCS or game one of the NLCS is on Tuesday, game one of the it, it's built so we'll have baseball every single day. I think that has to have something to do with it. Yeah, probably, most likely. Yeah. But um yeah in general I think the wild card round is have, was a success. I agree. I, I thought the game most of the games were all very good. Yeah. Um, there were really exciting moments and some yeah. depressing moments too, uh, depending <laughs> all... on your on your rooting interest. But I thought they sure. were great, and I think the start to the division series round has been really great as well. So, and Absolutely. you're seeing how even if you get through the wild card series round, how teams are punished. Like the Padres having to throw Mike Clevenger yeah. on on Tuesday night in Game One, and Massive man, is difference. he gonna? I guess if this goes five, does he get the Game Five start too? Uh, or are they gonna go like? I guess I they could he... do Manea. Or they could just do a bullpen like it's not know. going five. Yeah, it's not going five. <laughs> I I would be surprised, but uh, yeah, that's definitely something we can get into. Uh, just a reminder: if you don't have the NBC Sports Predictor app, go download it now. The contests are free and easy to play, and you have a shot to win thousands this weekend by predicting what will happen in college football, on the NASCAR circuit, and in the Premier League. There is also 100,000 up for grabs by guessing the outcome of the Cowboys and Eagles in our Sunday night seven contest. The Eagles are undefeated. I, I've, I've got to be honest with you. That, that was surprised me a little bit when I took a look at the record and saw uh, five and oh, I've, I've been a little busy with uh, Mariner stuff. I did not do not think that I had the Eagles being the last undefeated team. And I, I have a funny feeling you guys did not as well. I, I did not, but I it's a fun prop bet right now. Go to try to pick the Eagles first loss. Yes, absolutely. Come and try to combine that with something else. Like I think I did <laughs> Dodgers World Series. I picked the Eagles first loss. Nice. I will probably lose like I always do, but it, it's a fun little, fun <laughs> little challenge to do right now. I've got Jalen Hurts a good time. in fantasy, so I'm, I'm, I'm digging it. Oh, yep. you've got to dig it. By the way, I will say, quick brag. Your boy was the highest scoring in Scott Fishbowl this week. It certainly helped to have uh, wow. Josh Allen and Taysom Hill on his fantasy roster. Thank you for having tight end eligibility, Taysom Hill, because that very much helped. But that was pretty exciting. Um, overall, just three and two. But it was pretty cool to uh, outscore some of the uh, the fancier players in that league. Uh, so let's talk about the NLDS first, because we're going to be uh, seeing those games played, and we'll have two games done. Uh, let's start with Braves and Phillies. I got to be honest with you. I was stunned by the result yesterday and I was not stunned by the end result. I'm just surprised that Phil that Atlanta wasn't able to score a couple of more runs and come out ahead in this series. Uh, yep. For those unfamiliar, the Phillies won that game seven to six. Um, Ranger Suarez pitched pretty shakily, but Max Fried was even more shaky. Just could not get uh, out of that, out of any inning, I believe six runs were scored with two outs while he was in the game or somewhere along that line. 
I'll ask you first, Drew. Does that victory change your perception of this series at all? A little bit, because now the Phillies, you know, they got through the Rangers Suarez start in game one, like we talked about, being punished and having sure. to throw Wheeler and Nola in, in the wild card series. But now they've got Wheeler and Nola again in, in games two and three. And Nick Castellanos having a huge day is like massive for that offense. He had a really tough year, made Brilliant. a great play defensively, too. Who would have guessed that? Um, they're playing with a lot of confidence right now. Alec Baum has like looked awesome defensively. So um, weird. They're 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 a scary team now. And hey, this is a, a best of five, and they've got Wheeler and Nola in what could be, you know, a clinching setup to to possibly even sweep the defending World Series champions. I'm sure the Braves will push this further than three games, and this feels like a series that could go five. Um, but I'm impressed with with how the Phillies are 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 getting the job done right now. Yeah, totally. This to me, this game one was like a must-win game for the Braves because 100%. now, now all the pressure's on, and the Phillies have the pitching advantage matchups. The next two games, as we've said, uh, Wheeler, Morton uh, here in, in in game two. It is interesting that Spencer Strider is on the Braves roster. Mm -hmm. um, how much we see out of him after that oblique injury, I don't know. I think if you know one of these starters gets knocked out early, whether it's Morton or Kyle Wright. We could see Strider maybe in the middle innings, um, you know, try to throw a couple uh, to sure. keep it close or to bail out of, uh, you know, a pitcher who's struggling early in a game. I think he could be a, a big X factor here. But but yeah, I mean, you look at the game uh, this afternoon and I'm not sure when you whoever's listening to this, when you're listening to it. But uh, currently the Phillies money line is plus 115 on points mm. bet. Uh, I love a piece of that. I would I would be all over that. I would take the Phillies uh, on on Wednesday, but we'll we'll see how it goes. But yeah, I mean, I certainly think the Braves should should be concerned. It, it can get late quick in a five game series. And I, go ahead. Wheeler had like a pitch count itch, issue door, like toward the end of the regular season, but he's fully stretched out now too. So I I, I agree with that. I like that money line play. Yeah, yeah. one thing I should say about the about game one. If baseball was like a 10 inning game or an 11 inning game, as opposed <laughs> sure. to a nine game, the yeah, Phillies yeah. would have blew that lead. It would yes. have happened. But yeah. unfortunately for them, baseball is usually nine innings. Their bullpen <laughs> is gettable. That's for sure. That is definitely for we sure. We should um, mention David Robertson hurting himself, uh, oh. not being on the NLDS roster because he strained his calf celebrating a Bryce Harper home run during the wild card round. That is a very Phillies thing to happen. It is a very Phillies thing to happen, and it shortens what was already a very mediocre at best bullpen as well. Um, by the way, also, we had that and the Nick Maton injury where he punched uh, his locker for the uh, – but because apparently he was upset that he didn't get his brother out on yeah. Wednesday, which has got to be up there for normally like I, I get the I get sibling rivalries. Drew, you probably get it as well as anybody with uh, with the, with the, what you got going on in your life. But it's like what dumb, dumb stuff. I, the, the David Robertson, that's just a fluky thing. Like but at the yeah. same time, it's like I'm tempted to tell my guys like celebrate but stay on the ground <laughs> there is no reason for you to be jumping in these situations but yeah i think this is now a series that look i would have picked atlanta in four pretty easily i think this is something you got to favor the phillies in now just because of the fact that they are going to have um aaron nola and max scherzer pitching these next couple of games i think that's a massive benefit they got for them. scherzer they, they acquired oh him. excuse me zach wheeler thank you so much uh if max scherzer apparently is not in the postseason he's, we could probably talk, <laughs> talk yeah. about he's that. not good anymore either so. he's not good anymore either yeah that's um, uh, that's a dfa contract i'm sure but <laughs> i will say this atlanta like their starting pitching is good but there's no shutdown guy. There is no like, oh, he's definitely going to match this guy zero for zero. I have some questions about whether or not Kyle Wright can keep up uh, oh, yeah. with these guys. I have some questions about Charlie Morton being able to match up. So this is going to be uh, a really interesting series. We'll just give predictions real quick. I'll go ahead and say Phillies in four. Um, I will say Phillies in three. Wow. wow. Love it. Absolutely love it. Drew Burt? Um, man, it feels like recency bias that we're sure the Braves are really good and they're lining they up. Very good. I think they're going to, I think they're going to go to the world series. Yeah. They're going to score more runs off Wheeler and Nola than the Cardinals were able to. I, I'm going to say Braves in five. 
Okay. I like it. You like, know what? Like, I, I like seeing the. I want the Mets division. Uh, this is I can look at things objectively, but <laughs> I am also a fan, which is amazing that after doing this as sure. long as I have, that I still have this in me. But if I want the division rivals of the Mets to feel the most pain possible, I want the Braves to lose here and the <laughs> Phillies to move on. Who are a good team but flawed and then lose to the Dodgers. I'm just going to be like, all right, you know, I'm good now. Yes. And I can see it all playing out in front of oh. me. And I'm, I just want, I just want them to feel my pain. I sweet, sweet Schadenfreude. It is something that is even for analysts, we definitely have that oh, yeah. in our bones. So that other series that's going on is the Padres and Dodgers. Uh, Dodgers win on Tuesday, five to three. Julio Urias wasn't great. Mike Clevenger was not even close to great, and we kind of talked about before let how big of a uh, disadvantage it was for him to have to start game one. I'll, I'll start with you this time, DJ. Can the Padres get back into this series? I, I definitely think that they can. Um, and you just need to look to Tuesday's or Wednesday's matchup in game two with you, Darvish, yeah. on the hill. As sure. great as he's been since the start of September – uh, an ERA around 1.5, I believe, since the start of September. Dominated the Mets in the in the wild card round. The Padres should be feeling pretty good about the next two games because yeah. you know, Joe, Joe Musgrove can come back um, soon as well. I don't know if his day will be exactly on line for game three, but he'll be pitching in this at least to try to keep it close here as, as, it, as it moves along. Clayton Kershaw going in game two for the Dodgers. He's been awesome since coming off the I.L., as well, I think it's going to be a very tight game, but this is a this is a winnable game for the Padres. And if you look at the money line on the Padres, it's even a better bet than the Phillies plus one sixty five oh. one points bet. If you want to take a shot on the Padres, I think this is a winnable game for them. Um, I still like the Dodgers in the series, but they are still very much alive. True. I didn't see any of that game last night. I was at a, a concert. Uh, but just pulling up the box score this morning, I was impressed by the the work that the Dodgers bullpen did. 100%. Um, yeah, I mean, and Chris Martin getting the save at the end. I had to look up his stats. He's been awesome since yeah. joining Los Angeles. Like ERA below 1.5, I think at like a 34 to 1 strikeout to walk ratio. I had some questions about the Dodgers bullpen coming into this series. I think that was a, a big weakness for them. Uh, but the fact that they, the way it plotted out in game one and they, you know, met the call it makes you feel good about maybe the rest of this series i think this one probably are we doing predictions yet sure you can go with your predictions because i'll i'll I'll, mine will be quick as well i think this probably goes four and maybe the padres one win is comes tonight comes on wednesday night and then yeah i'd be be worried about uh, blake snell you know was great down the stretch but uh it feels like the dodgers might have his number yeah yeah, and yep. they can work. They can work pitchers, and Snell isn't always precise. No, yep. um, no, no. So that's I, the thing I agree. That, yeah. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say that's the thing that concerns me the most about Blake Snell is he might be the most inefficient, good starter that I've ever seen. Like, there's just mm-hmm. <laughs> there's a reason why it wasn't just Tampa Bay being silly with bullpen stuff. There was a reason why he only went five or six innings in these starts. It's because he threw like 115 pitches and walked four guys with six strikeouts as well and only ended up giving up one run. But this is like this Dodgers lineup, especially with all the quality right-handed bats that they have and some pretty darn good left-handed ones as well. That's a really tough matchup. I'll just say my prediction. I think the Dodgers are winning this in three. I, I really want you Darvish to get a win because he's one of my favorite human beings, much less pitchers. He's absolutely hilarious. And he's also supremely underrated in terms of what he's done over his career, which seems weird because he's a, a star, but we just don't seem to talk about him as one of the elite starters. And we, and we really should outside of a couple of hiccup years. I just think the Dodgers are just too good. And I don't think San Diego is going to be a massive home uh, advantage for that team as well. And whether or not that plays a factor or not is kind of up to interpretation, but I just think the Dodgers are, just too good. I don't see San Diego getting a win in this series. And, you know, Darvish's last start or last postseason start at Dodger Stadium was that game seven in 2017. Oh where he my got gosh. Like, I, he didn't. 
he didn't get out of the second inning got lit up mm. yeah i hope he gets revenge for that to yeah. be honest He'll even if i exercise some demons <laughs> there you go there you go yeah uh, i you're... think i think the padres get at least one win whether it's the darvish start or the musgrove start uh musgrove also pitched great down the stretch for that one hitter he threw against the mets um but and with the ear check and everything uh <laughs> We didn't even really get into that, but I think that's been yeah. out probably on Twitter already. We're already we already a little done. bit, uh, but I think I say Dodgers in four. Fair. This one. Yeah, it's it's. I would love to see San Diego advance. It's we joked about it in the podcast that we did with Colin that I think it would be hilarious to have a Padres Philadelphia LCS after all the big three and stuff like that. It would be mm-hmm. a ton of fun to see. And again. If the San Diego Padres could wear their City Connect jerseys in these games, I would change things, <laughs> my opinion, considerably, but they cannot. Uh, let's move over to the American League, where yesterday we saw the Guardians fall to the New York Yankees 4-1. to one. Garrett Cole, I thought, pitched pretty well after kind of a shaky start. Um, Cal Quantrill uh, did okay, but this is a very tough lineup to beat. This was one of the more intriguing series to me on paper to start the series, and I'll ask DJ... I think this one has a chance to still go the distance. Do you agree? I do. I I, I obviously gave the Yankees the advantage in, in game one uh, with Cole. Sure. Uh, versus, and the, the Guardians didn't have their pitching the lined up exactly the way they would have wanted, which is the advantage of being the, you know, the, the buy team um, that they, the wildcard teams go through their top starters. But now it kind of shuffles back uh, where you'll get Bieber and McKenzie. I think they're going to, if they can pitch around Aaron Judge, this can be a very competitive series, and they should absolutely pitch around Aaron Judge because I the rest of the Yankees lineup doesn't really scare me that much. No. Rizzo's Rizzo's had a good year, and you know we saw him hit a home run last night. So you know you can still get hurt, but it's a it's a lineup you can pitch through. Um, so and the we know the Guardians bullpen is very good as well. I, I think they have a great chance, but it's just a matter of how much offense the Guardians yeah. can can reasonably put together because now I think. Through 33 innings in the postseason, they've scored four total runs. And one of them is Stephen Kwan. Kwan, Homer. bomb. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, yep. Drew, how about you? Do you think this one can go the distance, or do you have a specific favorite? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think the Yankees are a juggernaut. We talked about this on uh, our like postseason preview episode a little bit. Sure. Um, but the, the guard are the guardians really the team that's going to take them out. I'd be worried about a lack of thump one run in, in game one from that Stephen Kwan bomb. Uh, Jose Ramirez is going to have to have some big hits. Massive. Yeah. But I don't know. I mean, the pitching matchups get better moving forward for Cleveland. And that's, pr- that's the edge that they have on the Yankees is pitching and defense. It's how they kind of ran away with the AL central at the end. Um, it's, it's why they're here. It's why they, ousted the Rays. I think this one could go the distance. I, I think the Guardians can come back and win. Um, if I'm making a prediction, though, I'm going to probably say Yankees in five. How about Drew? Um, uh, how about DJ? What, what's your prediction for the series? I went into the series saying Guardians in five, and I am going to stick with it. I like it. Um, because I think I that, was think... My, yeah, that was my my prediction as well. Sorry to cut uh, you I think the Guardians take the next two games. Um, but I think there's something to be said for, you know, how uh, there's always people who are like, you know, why can't they just, you know, make contact, and, you know, play small ball and, and like do all that. But you're seeing in the postseason, I mean, the Mets experience this, like the Mets make a lot of contact. They, you know, have good at bats. They, you know, can wear out pitchers. But like, if you're not getting power, like it's just really hard to advance in the playoffs and go far. Uh, I think that's going to be an issue for the Guardians, whether it rears its head in this series or as they move on or whatever the case might be. Uh, but I do think the Guardians' uh, whole approach is it's very tenuous. Yeah. Yeah, I 100% agree. It is not uh, what has been successful for most of the – at least the past few postseasons. So it's interesting. I'm going to go Yankees in five. I think a big advantage here is the fact that – New York is going to get Garrett Cole for game one and game four on full rest. And we'll talk about that with the the other series as well. I think that's a huge advantage. I think they win those two games. And then I imagine Monday, uh, Nestor Cortez can do uh, who I would assume would be the game five starter or even a bullpen day. I think they can do 
just enough. If the if the series was in Cleveland, I would probably pick them as the winner in Game Five. But I think it's going to be a really competitive series. Maybe one of the more would we agree low scoring series of the four? Probably. Yeah. Yeah, if they don't if they don't give Aaron Judge anything to hit. Yeah, that's a hundred percent it. And I imagine I had, that what did he what did he finish last night? Like oh for three with three strikeouts though. Postseason Aaron Judge Shohei Otani winning the MVP right now from his postseason. All the votes are hopefully in. Um, so let's close with the series that I really didn't want to talk about, but we've uh-huh. got to uh, the Seattle Mariners and the Houston Astros. And for those of you. Who know me, you know that I have rooted for that team, especially for my grandma, uh, for my life and a pretty devastating loss, an 8-7 loss on a walk-off three-run homer by Jordan Alvarez, who is just spectacular. And I imagine we'll be getting a lot of third place votes in the AL MVP, if not unanimously, uh, it'll be pretty darn close. I imagine that he's going to finish in the top three or four at the very least. So I'll just ask you guys this. I'll start with you, Drew. Robbie Ray pitching in that situation. What did you think of it? I don't really understand it. And I kind of want to throw it back to you. What was what was the plan there? What was so, the thinking behind that? It would there be like is, his bullpen day? Yeah, it was, it was bullpen day. And there's also speculation that Robbie Ray is not going to start a game in this series, partially yeah. because of the fact that Robbie Ray has been crushed by the Astros this year and has kind of been crushed by – teams above 500. I believe his ERA oh. against teams um, above 500 was something like 4.6, which is not great. And I don't think that they have a ton of confidence. I think George Kirby is going to probably be that game three starter. Now I have a lot of question marks about that as well. Uh, his spin rate and his velocity as a starter down the stretch was way down and he was not throwing strikes at the same pace as a normal George Kirby does. I think it's one of the most horrific decisions that I've ever seen a manager make because Robbie Ray is not 99 and wipe out slider. This is not like the starting version of Josh Hader you're bringing in. And this is also not Jordan Alvarez is not to throw it back to a former Seattle Mariner, Paul Sorrento, who had like a 1000 OPS against right handers and just flat out struck out every single time he faced a left hander. Jordan Alvarez hits everybody. I think it was a massive mistake. DJ, I'd like your thoughts as well. I mean, the outcome would certainly say yes, it was a mistake. Um, but yeah, I mean, you look at the situation they had there with Paul, Paul Seawald. Like, he looked shaky in that yep. inning. Um, but Paul Seawald had held lefties to a 589 OPS this yep. season. Robbie Ray against lefties this year, 647 OPS. Yep. So I don't know. I, I it's and, it was it was a gutsy move, but maybe not a smart one. Yeah, that's um, that's that's what I would go with. It's I think gutsy is the right move, and I just you know we talk about process and result. I think the process of it was bad. Like that is just such a hard situation. And look, if you guys saw the pitches, they were ninety four middle middle. Middle I have middle. To question, yeah. I have to question. Um, my good friend, Big Dumper, if he's calling that game, what are you doing, bud? There is no reason to be throwing middle, middle pitches in that situation to legitimately one of the five best offensive players in the sport, in my personal opinion. By the way, there's also Eric Swanson in that bullpen as well, who's yeah. held lefties to a 517 OBS this year. Go. Like a legitimately superb against left-handed pitching. And that's 107 plate appearances against left handers So it's not – like a massive sample size, but it's far from small, especially for a reliever. Uh, yeah. yeah. DJ. And, and it's yeah, devastating. It's uh, just in general for this Hard. series. Like that was a game. The uh, you, you could have penciled that in for a win from the mm-hmm. Astros from the jump with Justin Verlander, you know, the probable AM, AL Cy Young award winner pitching. You kind of expected a win from the Astros. So for the Mariners to be in that position where it would have been a gift for them. Yep. setting yep. up per- perfectly for Luis Castillo in, oh. you know, in, in game two there. You could have been up to, to zip in this series with all the momentum uh, and then going back home too. So sorry, Chris, I'm just, <laughs> it's such a bummer, man, because I'm just saying and now it's, now it's, it's just looking very unlikely that the Mariners can turn this around. They could definitely win the Luis Castillo start. I, I yep. can see that very, very much happening. Um, sure. But it's it's very hard to win three out of four here, which is what they're going to have to do. It's know? it's it's such a blown opportunity. And look, if they get the win on Thursday, that's that's great, and you got your split, which is probably what you were hoping for in the first place. 
But what a golden opportunity blown if you do win on Thursday to be up to nothing to take advantage. Because Justin Verlander was terrible. That was yeah. one of the worst starts I've seen Justin Verlander make, not just this year, but like ever. Like, And it's interesting. Somebody pointed this out. Justin Verlander has absolutely dominated the Oakland Athletics in postseason games and has been pretty mediocre at best against everybody else. It huh. kind of just a little interesting stat, something like a 1.24 ERA against the Oakland Athletics and not quite as high or good against everybody else. Uh, I wish I had huh. that number in front of me. I'm not good at my job. I am just going to go out and say, I'll say that the Astros win this one in four. Um, I'm just glad, hoping it's not a sweep. I'm going to be at the game on f- Saturday. I'm really looking oh, forward sweet. to it. Please don't. Hey, and in fact, I'm actually going to be in a sweep. This is just a real quick funny story. Uh, my buddy uh, said that if the Seattle Mariners ever made the postseason again, he would buy a sweep. And I, we all said, ha ha, good luck with that. And he stuck to his word and he did it. He bought a suite for the game. And uh, I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, Good for that guy. I might be sending him a few shekels uh, or a couple of uh, uh, Jeremy Pena rookie cards or something like that to (laughs) to make up for it. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. But at the same time, I think the Astros win this one in four. I'm rooting for the Mariners. I mean, that that's the team I'm rooting for overall w- with the teams that are left in this field. But uh, there's Astros have too much, too okay. much hitting, too much pitching. I think they're going all the way to the World Series and, and possibly winning it. I, they're just so dangerous. They've got everything you need to, to, to run the table. Sure. How many games this series? Um, Astros in three. Sorry, okay. Chris. That's, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> I we will say that. <laughs> I'll say Astros in four, and yeah, they're they are super dangerous. Yeah, they're, I mean, they are to me, and we can kind of argue this a little bit, but they are the most complete team in baseball. I think that because of the fact, look, the Dodgers bullpen looked really good yesterday. I have some question marks still about the back end of that bullpen. Yeah. Like, I, I need to see it for more than for than one game, and I want to see how they handle like either the Atlanta or Philadelphia lineup. I think that will be a great test for them, uh, assuming they get by this. But I just think Houston has everything. They literally have everything that you want. They have guys who can make hard contact. They have guys who can hit for power. They can steal bases. They're a very solid defensive team. It's unfortunate that Mariners have to run into this, unfortunately, but uh, that's just the way it's going to go. Um, Anything else that uh, you guys think we need to talk about? I think we've probably hit the nail on the head. I think we've, uh, yeah, I think we've hit yeah. everything. From these yeah. Guys. Were we, yeah. Were it's we planning great. on a, a draft for for next year, an early, like, three-round fantasy draft? We're going to do that next week, maybe? We could talk about this. We'll have, yeah. to see when, we'll have to see when the off days are for these series sure. and, and, and what we can squeeze in. We should maybe give a standings update to our yes. baseball challenge. Do you want to give right. that update, DJ? Do you have that in front well, of you? If not, I got I, I do. I, I'm it. losing as I, by a lot. <laughs> All right. So if you if you missed our last episode, it was our wild card series preview. But we each uh, each of us picked a team uh, with 12, uh, 12 spots, one from each playoff team. So kind of a fun little exercise. So we I have the standings through the wild card round. Right now, Colin is winning 58. He's at uh, on top 58 points. Chris has 56. I have 52. Uh, Drew has uh, <clears throat> 32. How did that go so bad for you? Like, what is the big difference here? Because, like, I don't feel like you made as many. Um, Housley was a bad picks. play. Oh, the Housley uh, situation. Housley, yeah. Manoa didn't pitch well. Scherzer didn't pitch well. Yeah. What's funny is, is that we both picked relievers who only got one game in. Um, but my guy stunk and didn't give up a run before getting injured. And unfortunately, Helsley. Uh, by the way, our buddy Chad uh, on Twitch tells us first, every other team in the postseason, he has a Verlander as a 4.17 ERA. That is not dominant and a 10 and 11 record, whether or not you want to think about wins and losses. But yeah, that's that. I, th- I was very surprised because that I think you, you look at Justin Verlander and you just think dominant postseason pitcher uh one other thing i wanted to promote please check out our team rundowns on roto world that we're posting one every weekday we're starting off with the not so hot uh dj and i both had to figure out nice things to say about the nationals and athletics which is one of the most 
challenging things I have done in my baseball career, to be honest with you. Uh, and I know that you had must have struggled it without. Uh, it was the fact bad. you didn't just write Joey Manessas three thousand times is honestly <laughs> one impressive. To. Yeah, uh, but yeah, but yeah check those. I'm Pucci. finishing up the Pirates right now. Hey. Writing about the bad teams is so much harder. It's like it's really hard because right. like you can go forever on the bad teams, but it is very hard to find any type of positive stuff other than saying, hey, look at this farm system, which isn't all that interesting yeah. to talk about, even as a yeah. prospect. Guy. But please read it. Please, read please read it. it. Oh, yes, absolutely. Right. They're great <laughs> stuff. We're pretty funny. I got a good shot at the Oakland Athletics ownership at the end of Vine. Uh, so that was Ooh, fun to do. Yeah. Yeah. That, I'm going to um, use, use that for my Pirates one, too. I'm there you go. Very good. Yeah. Perfect. I love to inspire my Drubert. Uh, thank you guys so much for listening. Uh, we'll be back next week to talk about what should be the LCS and previewing those series. That's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, we really appreciate everybody listening. You can follow me at Crawford underscore MILB on Twitter. You can follow DJ Short at DJ Short. And you can follow Drew Silva at Drew Silva. Uh, if you like what you're hearing, please subscribe. Hit the five stars. All of that good stuff. We really do appreciate it. Enjoy these playoffs, and we will be back with you next week.